Greetings and welcome to yet another episode of Outstanding Sri Lankan Role Models. I have the privilege today of having Mr. Aritha Vikramasinghe, a human rights activist, a lawyer, a policymaker, and a dear friend. Aritha is an English law qualified solicitor with 10 years of experience in international finance and public policy. He trained and worked at one of the world's most prestigious law firms, Clifford Chance and KNL Gates in London before moving back to Sri Lanka, where he has been working with the government of Sri Lanka since 2017. He has advised on over 200 major financial transactions, including multi-billion dollar projects involving the world's largest banks and institutions in multiple jurisdictions. Aritha is the founding trustee of the global education initiative Think Equal and a director of I Pro Bono, an organization that provides justice to people that cannot afford it. Their network has over 80,000 lawyers in nearly 40 countries. In recognition of his work, he was ranked by the world's number one international newspaper, The Financial Times, as a future business leader in their 2015 Outstanding List, alongside Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg and Lloyd CEO Inga Bale. Aritha has been a guest speaker at the University of Oxford, London Business School, King's College, IESE Business School, Clifford Chance, Barclays Investment Bank, and the Financial Times. Aritha, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Prashant. Thank you for saying yes, and I'm so excited to have this conversation with you on various fronts. But for our viewers, what we really want to do is to identify amazing young role models for young people in Sri Lanka to follow, but also for our citizens in general. And we're looking at four attributes and characters. And the first one is character. And Aritha, having followed your career and been a friend over a few years now, one thing I've seen that really resonates with me is here's somebody who has had an amazing academic career, has an amazing professional career. You were in a law firm in the United Kingdom, almost 15 years outside the country. You could have easily joined millions of Sri Lankans who decided to stay away. But you made a decision to come back. And tell me a little bit about that journey and how, that, how you started that journey. Yeah, I mean, I studied here in Sri Lanka. I went to school here and I went to the UK for my higher education. And after I did my law, uh, I did my first degree in political science, actually. And even then, my, you know, it was in the midst of Sri Lanka's civil war. There was a ceasefire going on. And we were all children of that war. And my dissertation was actually on Sri Lanka's civil war, its conflict, its foundational causes of that conflict, what are the possible solutions. Um, so my academic studies was also very much focused on Sri Lanka. Um, and then I did my law and I worked uh, for the UN Genocide Tribunals in Rwanda briefly. And I returned back to the UK for a master's. And, you know, although I always had that passion for justice, um, justice doesn't pay. Mm. And I ended up with a commercial corporate career in London, which I'm very grateful for. It's one of the best law firms in the world. Mm. Um, I had a very successful career there. And I think I started really deciding to come back to Sri Lanka when uh, I got ranked very highly by the Financial Times. I was ranked as the number one future leader. And that ranking was incredible because A, I never expected to get that kind of recognition for the work I was doing. And B, you know, I was ranked alongside Mark Zuckerberg. You know, he was a bit more popular back in 2015 than he is now. And I was also ranked alongside the CEO of Lloyd's of London, biggest insurance company in the world. And then I thought to myself, you know, uh, what's the point of me doing all of this work here uh, in a country which doesn't really need me? Mm. Um, there are lots of other lawyers mm -hmm. in the UK, and especially a city like London has thousands of lawyers lining up to join the kind of firms that I was working in. And then I thought it's very, it's so much more important for me to go come back to Sri Lanka at the peak of my career almost, at the peak of the global recognition I was getting for, you know, the work I was doing, which was transforming these major capitals and these major businesses. And I thought I'm going to come back here. I'm going to walk the talk. Uh, I need to give back. 
to my people and my country. And now I have the skills and the credibility to do that. No one can turn around and call me mediocre. No one can call or turn around and say, hey, you came here to Sri Lanka to seek better, a better opportunity because you couldn't make it abroad. I made it, you know, I, I became the top uh, of the work I'm doing. And I came here while I was at the top, giving up what would have been a very successful legal partnership career in one of some of the best law firms in the world. Um, so I have that credibility and I wanted to come and give back. And I think it's, you know, many of us, like you said, we leave this country. Uh, and it's unfortunate that so many Sri Lankans seem to achieve their best when they're out of this country. And I think, you know, fine, that's, that's sad, but go achieve what you can achieve. Be the best you can. But at the end of the day, you know, there's, we have all family here. There are communities here. People in this country also deserve better. And if we can be part of that solution, then we should be. Yeah. It's very well said. And I think that's a very appropriate call to our Sri Lankan young people right now, considering I'm sick and tired of this. I need to go. I need something better for myself. But I think at some point, country and serving people who are less fortunate in our own context takes precedence over our own, you know, wanting to say, my, my thing is more prominent. But at the same time, it hasn't been easy, right? You come back here, there are challenges. At the same time, you're working with in the public sector. You're working in situations where there may have been temptations for corrupt behavior, unethical behavior. And you might feel, hey, I've sacrificed so much already. Maybe I should benefit a little bit. But you haven't. How do you stay true to those values and morals when, when it's so prevalent in our society today? I mean, yes, I work in the public sector. I work very closely still with the public sector. Uh, is there corruption? Yes, there is corruption. Um, I think one thing I've really learned and which has always been part of my ethos is that there's a lot of things that people can take away from you. Uh, they can take your money, your wealth. They can even take away your family. Um, but they can't take away your integrity. And living that truth and being yourself, mm. it can be very hard, um, but it's still something that no one can take away from you. And I think that's something I learned very early on as a gay man. Mm. You know, we live in a country where LGBT people, people like me are still criminalized mm. or treated differently. And I came out very early when I was 15 years old here in Sri Lanka about my sexual orientation. Because for me, it was always important to live my truth and to be honest with people. And I always knew that that was something that no one could take away from me. My story, my truth. And it's the same thing with your profession. Um, you don't have to bend down to plea to satisfy other people's pleasures. Uh, we all have a professional duty in the work we do. And it is important that we live by those professional duties because sometimes the smallest mistake uh, can lead to us losing all of this work that we put into come exactly. here. So moving from character to our next pillar on compassion, you know, you could have easily lived in the Western world or in England where there were more freedoms and there were more privileges. And you're coming to a country where there is criminalization, there is so much of uh, attacks on the community. And for those who are in a privileged context, maybe they can ride the wave, but those who are not are constantly experiencing deep levels of stigma and harassment and pain. And you would move with compassion to respond and stand by them. And let me, let me hear more about that journey of how have you let your compassion respond to those in need? You know, you're 100% right. Uh, there is a significant, maybe minority of people who are privileged and I am one of those people. I am highly privileged, I'm financially privileged, class privileged, professionally privileged. Mm -hmm. And I think with that privilege come certain duties for us. It was a, for me, when I got that ranking from the Financial Times, you know, I really thought about, wow, here is 
a gay man from Sri Lanka who came to the UK as an immigrant and I have got the same, I've been, I've managed within my 15 years there to achieve the same status as these white people who are from these countries and who've built these amazing successful businesses. And that really put me in a position of privilege. And in a way I thought it's unfair that privileged people are not doing enough to ensure that something as simple as being yourself has to be a privilege. You know, mm. I realized increasingly that my coming out, me being accepted by my family and friends, me being able to have a successful career is all because of the privileges I have. And I don't think if we if you're living in a country where to be yourself is an act of bravery and where to be yourself is a status of being privileged well then that's the kind of country and culture that we have to change mm -hmm. because the vast majority of people don't have that opportunity and I wanted to be part of that change mm -hmm. I wanted to use my privilege to ensure that other people had access to the same resources that I do and I don't think it's derived by this a certain kind of uh, compassion or it should be seen as this kind of noble thing to do. Uh, I think it is a duty amongst all people with access to resources and privileges to ensure that everyone has a decent and dignified life. Mm -hmm. No matter what, what their difference is, not just sexual orientation, it's race, religion, class, gender, um, all of that. Yeah. And that speaks into the other elements of activism that you're involved in. It seems very a sincere and an authentic desire to respond to those who have been marginalized, those who have been suppressed in society. Uh, you stand up very aggressively against hate speech, about, against cyberbullying, against uh, issues of women are facing in this country. And so you're moved with the conviction that things need to be better. Now, for a young person out there who has similar convictions, how do you go from feeling emotionally hurt and feeling that this is wrong to then doing something meaningful? How does compassion become impressive, effective engagement? I think a lot of the time when injustices happen, unfair things happen, we get angry and that's okay. That's natural to get angry. I get angry too. But then before we respond to that injustice, before we respond and react to our anger, I think it's important for us to comprehend our anger, mm. to really understand why we are feeling this way, and to really rationalize how we should respond to that. Because a lot of the time, people who are committing these injustices, they're irrational themselves. Mm. Um, they have anger themselves. And if we are going to respond to anger and irrationality with anger mm. and irrationality, neither party is going to be able to talk to each other. Mm. At least one party needs to mm. have the ability and the ability to listen in order to respond in the right manner, in order to resolve that issue. And there is power in that ability to listen and take a few moments to think about mm -hmm. it. Yeah. There's a lot of power in it. And having that power and have, would mean that you have more control over that conversation and you would have more control over the final result. Mm -hmm. um, we must not try to turn our backs to people who disagree with us. Okay. That's a key point then. We're talking about a, a generation that's struggling when they have more progressive ideals and values of moving away from this cancel culture. If I, you and I may have things that we don't agree on, but we don't walk away from the table. We don't burn a bridge. And you've really tried to embody this. I've seen you in situations where clearly people that you disagree with and you are not in the same page, or not on the same page, but still you're willing to continue the dialogue because you see the common humanity, you see the need for compassion. Tell us how to do that. Especially for younger generations that feels like, no, we need to cancel them, they need to be quiet, they need to be you know, punished for believing that. 
they don't have a right to believe that anymore. Like, how, how have you been different? You're countercultural in this. Uh, you used a very good term, um, common humanity. We all have a common humanity. We all share a certain set of values. We all want to pursue our own happiness, no matter what that path is. And sometimes the paths we take to pursue that happiness can be harmful. Mm -hmm. But if we can appeal to your opponent's common humanity, you can also bring them closer to a path where both of you can take together. And it's frustrating. It's not something quick. And I feel, you know, we live in an age, we've been brought up in an age of, uh, of instant gratification. We want instant results. We want our Uber pick me to pick us up in two minutes. We will cancel the taxi that's going to take four minutes. Um, an age of and a culture of instant gratification means that we also don't, we struggle to have yeah. the patience to wait for the right results. Mm. But the best results are often the consequence of effort yeah. and long term effort. Yeah. And with you know, you can't, many people who may have harmful thoughts or bigoted thoughts, these are consequences of their own childhood, mm. what their adults have told them. Mm. Um, they are a consequence of, you know, years and sometimes decades of a certain pattern of thinking. Yep. You can't expect that individual to change within one conversation. You have to be willing to, in a way, hold their hands sometimes and be willing to walk that path of change together. Yeah. And I think if we have that faith in that common humanity, it's achievable. Yeah. And also the beauty of refining ideas, refining people and learning through the process as well. And I've seen you do that extremely well. And I think it's a very important model for the next generation. Moving on to our next pillar is competence. You may have compassion, you may have the character, but if you're not equipped to make a difference, you're not able to. And you talked about it to a certain extent about your academic and your professional experience, but how did you get there? I know obviously you're bright and you're gifted academically and you worked hard, but what are some key principles that helped you become competent in your field? For young people who are trying to become somewhere, reach some pinnacle in their careers and in their academic life. I wouldn't say I'm particularly bright and gifted. I wasn't a star class student in school. I mean, I wasn't like an all A student. I would get A's and B's and sometimes C's, you know? So, but one of the best advice I got uh, when I was doing my Olivers was my accounts teacher. I had, um, I had done some homework where I didn't make much effort in the homework. And she saw that and she said, Aritha, you either aim for an A or you aim to fail. Don't do half-hearted things and don't do things if you're not interested in it. There's no point in that. And I really took that advice to heart since then. Um, for me, if I'm doing something, I do it because I want to and I will put all my effort to do the best in that. It doesn't mean that I want to be the number one in it against all other people. It's the best version of myself mm -hmm. and the best effort I can put in with my capacity. No shortcuts. No shortcuts and knowing that I am putting my best here. Mm -hmm. And that's how over the years I built that confidence. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes a while. We're always learning. I am still learning. But you have to be open to that learning. You have to be open to constantly improving yourself and being determined to be that best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. So let's say that a young person is trying, okay, they're working on their character, they're working on being compassionate and responding to needs in our society. They're working on becoming competitive. But at the same time, you need some sort of direction where you're heading. You need a purpose. You need a clarity of vision. What's your vision for yourself? What, what's the best version of yourself that we can see in the years to come? What do you want to become? At the same time, what's your one element of your vision for Sri Lanka? 
like in our 60s and 70s, maybe sharing a cup of coffee, what would we like to celebrate and say, this is, this is something we've accomplished? God, um, my vision for Sri Lanka is a Sri Lanka where everyone is treated fairly and justly. Mm. For me, justice is very important because I've really seen the, with the work I do, uh, the human impact of injustices and the toll it takes on society as a whole. So a Sri Lanka which is more fair and more just, a Sri Lanka with a more robust legal system, and a Sri Lanka where people have more equity in wealth. Mm. Uh, doesn't mean everyone has to have millions of dollars, uh, but a Sri Lanka where everyone can have a decent quality of life uh, is what I really want. Um, for me personally, um, I would want to, when I leave this life, I would want to have left this country in a better place than when I was born here. I think it has got better, not thanks to me, but due to so much work that everyone has put in. Uh, and I want to be part of that team uh, to make sure that future generations and future Sri Lankans have a place where they don't have to line up outside the immigration department to leave. Mm -hmm. A place where they want to stay back. Uh, and a place which will give them the opportunity to be a best in the world. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go to a Western capital to be the best anymore. Mm -hmm. You can do it here. Yeah. That's a perfect way to end. Aritha, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for your character and thank you for being a model, a role model for young Sri Lankans. And young citizens around the world. And so thank you for giving us this opportunity thank as well. You. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. <laughs> for all of you who are watching, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll continue to feature amazing, inspiring Sri Lankans who are looking to transform our nation's future. So thank you for your willingness to support and your willingness to be the change that you and I need to be to change our nation and our world. Thank you for watching. We'll be back again with another episode of Outstanding Young Sri Lankan Role Models.